how did you find the Ukrainian counteroffensive so far? Uh, has it produced any result for Ukrainian or is it going to produce any result for them? Well, it has a very negative result. They've lost a lot more soldiers. Um, if you just look at the what the Russians, the Soviets, used to call the uh, the balance of forces or uh, what we call sometimes the battlefield equilibrium, right now you've got a, a nation with 10 time zones and 140 plus million people up against a nation that barely has one time zone and uh, basically now has gone from some 40 million down to about 30 million and has lost 300,000 killed on the battlefield. Um, this is the recipe, of course, for defeat, complete defeat. Um, the next thing they're going to get faced with is a Russian offensive on Odessa and uh, a threat by the Russians to take Odessa which would eliminate their last port capable of, for example, exporting grain. Um, it's a disaster. It's been a disaster since it started, and any military expert who is not paid by the media or isn't stupid knows that this is an uneven contest, even with NATO throwing everything it possibly can, except its own soldiers, into the battle is a losing proposition for Ukraine. There's no way they can win. Out of out of three main elements, or maybe four elements, that we can call it weaponry, manpower, and tactics, and even morale between Ukrainian, do you think which one played the biggest role in this failed counteroffensive? Unfortunately, the same one that uh, Napoleon, Clausewitz, and a number of other war theorists would say is the most powerful one, and that's morale. But unfortunately, that's a pyrrhic thing for the Ukrainians because what that morale did was give them expectations that were impossible. Um, and, and now they're operating in a grinding offense against the defense, and they're being ground up, um, and they're going to continue to be ground up. And there's not too many more of them to be ground up. That's what you get when you have such an imbalance between the correlation of forces. On the one hand, you have one of the most robust industrial bases in the world. You have strategic depth that the Nazis couldn't even overcome with one of the best armies on the face of the earth at the time. And you have the resilience that comes along with that and the stubbornness that comes along with that. And you're trying to crack it, not with the Wehrmacht, not with the German war machine. You're trying to crack it with Ukraine supported by NATO without any real fundamental support on the battlefield in terms of soldiers, airplanes in the air, ships at sea, and so forth. So they're going to lose. They're going to lose. And that's the tragedy of it in my mind. It's so clear to me as a military professional they're going to lose. And yet we are backing them to the last dead Ukrainian. We're staying in there because we're making fortunes off of this. Lockheed Martin, in particular, is making a lot of money. Raytheon is making a lot of money. Um, there are others who are making money off of it through other means. And there are people who are having uh, their theory of NATO expansion supposedly confirmed. Well, what they're going to find out probably within 12 to 18 months is NATO is going to fall apart. It's going to fall apart over this issue and over the fact that we've done what we've done to the Germans, we've done what we've done to others in NATO, mainly to reestablish our economic hegemony over Europe. That's our primary motivation, not saving Ukraine. It's reestablishing our economic hegemony over Europe, which we were losing to whom? China. Ukraine, in fact, was at the end of their main base road initiative, which is over land and was going to be the intrapo for China, to essentially unload on Europe <laughs> the way the way they unloaded loaded on the United States for the last 15, 20 years. Um, and that that's stopped now, pretty much, uh, unless someone wakes up and changes what they're doing, and I don't think they're going to. I mean, look, we're we're establishing uh, essentially a Cold War with China too. So 
we wrecked everything that was happening that was probably pretty positive if we just had some brains and, and gone along with it to the extent we could and to the extent it was in our interest to do so and in the Germans' interest and the French' interest and so forth. To tell Germany and to tell France that they can't deal with China anymore? Huh. How long do you think the transatlantic link is going to persist with that kind of advice, direction coming out of Washington? Now, it's been aided mightily, and, and I was there when we started this, by us engineering leaders in Europe who, who agree with us. To start with, Jan Stoltenberg. I mean, he's our man. He's our person. They all agree with us. One of the reasons Norway and Finland and Sweden and others, not just fear of uh, Putin, which is a really a, a misplaced fear, Putin has no intention of attacking any of them. He's simply reacting to what we did in terms of expanding NATO. He's trying to push those that expansion, if you will, back a little bit because it was getting very dangerous. You take those uh, dual-purpose anti-ballistic missile assets we're putting in new NATO countries and we're going to put in Ukraine, all you do is just, it takes about 24 hours to rejigger them and you put uh, ground launch cruise missiles on them with nuclear warheads. I don't blame him for being frightened of that. I would be too, especially when we just negated the INF treaty. Um, so uh, it's understandable what's Putin done, what, what Putin has done. It's cruel and it's brutal and it probably shouldn't have been the, the solution he sought. But let's face it, he's been trying to do something about it all along, arguably since 2002, 2003, but certainly since 2014. And every time we do something, we violate it or we don't sign up to it. Um, so we're looking at a situation now where he's going to get his wishes. He's going to get his wishes through a brutal display of power that is probably going to change the whole complexion of Central Europe, too. And that's sad. That's very sad because we had an opportunity post-Cold War to make Russia a part of Europe in a genuine way, not just a geographic way, and to bring another 148, 150 million people into Europe and into the consortium that Europe would be and probably be the most powerful one on Earth eventually. After all, their GDP of the 740 million people in the EU right now is equivalent of ours. Um, so there was all kind of potential there. But we basically... And we had some cooperation from Paris and a lot of cooperation from London have stopped that now. And we stopped it for our own interest. And I think it's going to be ultimately to our disinterest. What's going on in the mind of these generals like Petraeus? Because just two days ago, he was giving a interview to CNN. He said that Ukrainians are trying to do something. They need to do something in this counteroffensive, and we have to provide them with new weapons. This is the same rhetoric we've seen all along this battle. Why they're not changing their mind? Because it didn't produce any result for them. They're caught essentially in their own rhetoric and, if you will, hoist on their own petard. Um, and, and I would ask David, who, whom I have been around for some time, when's the last time you won a war, David? Uh, he lost in Iraq. He lost in Afghanistan. He became the overall commander as U.S. Central Command commander and lost there. Then he became the director of the CIA and had a sordid affair and had to leave that job. So I wouldn't take David's advice on how to pickle a herring. Nor would I take probably most of the generals who are and admirals who are speaking on television because they are part of the war machine. They're part of the empire. They're part of the imperial writ. And they don't know any other word than to support, extend, and, and, and uh, more or less comply with that writ. The fact that they appear on media, to me, is uh, it, it's reason for me to just turn to tune them out. Um, we have too many of these flag officers who are, you know, we have the former director of the National Security Agency of the United States of America, General Keith Alexander, now on MBS's payroll. He's working for Mohammed bin Salman. And I recently appeared before a committee in the Congress and expressed some displeasure with that, ethically and security-wise. This is a man that designed all the things that spy on Americans today, illegally. You know what they said back to me, particularly the Republican members? Well, that's his right. He needs to make millions of dollars. 
This is a four-star Army general who was NSA director for almost eight years, and now he's working for Mohammed bin Salman. I guarantee you what he's doing for MBS. And on the other hand, we have we've seen the, the totally detachment of Biden administration from the reality. Biden just recently said that Russia already lost this war in 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 Ukraine, and we have the foreign minister of. Uh, Great Britain that said that it's time to it, it's time for Putin taking out all those troops in Ukraine. How how do you see these these politicians? These are the people who are deciding about these wars. I think they live in a strange world. They believe that their rhetoric will somehow go out there and float around in the ether and become real, and that's simply not going to happen. Um, but I got to say, they're being led by the nose, if you will, by basically Washington and London. And you, you have a little bit of occasional pushback from Macron, a little bit of pushback from the Bundestag, a little bit of pushback from some other leaders that I, I know about under the covers, if you will. <laughs> but nothing really significant because they're all going along with the line that Washington and London have expressed for them. Um, and that's, as I said, come back in 18 months, if I'm still alive, I'm getting pretty old, come back in 18 months and ask me to uh, reaffirm the fact that the transatlantic link is going to break. And you know, I go back to Powell's comments in 1989 when I first joined him. He was a brand new four-star, just left being Ronald Reagan's final national security advisor. And we we're talking in the office the first month I was with him. So I'm a lieutenant colonel. I'm not going to challenge him too much at, at this point. I later learned that I can challenge him at will, and he won't do anything about it because he's a different kind of general. He'll just argue with me, and if he likes my advice, he'll take it. If he doesn't like it, he won't. So very different kind of general. Um, he looks at me, and he says, Larry, they're all gone. And I said, who, sir? He said, Cole. Mitterrand, Thatcher, Major, they're all gone. All those in Europe who had their feet in the war. And, of course, he meant World War II. As soon as we get a group of leaders in Europe who do not remember, remember the war, do not remember the sacrifice, do not appreciate the sacrifice, or however you want to phrase it, things will start to change. Well, we're going to see that. We're going to see that big time, and we've just reinforced it. Look at what the Germans are doing right now. They're paying through the nose for their energy now, and it's dirty energy. It's mostly coming from the Permian Basin in the United States. It's dirty energy, and they're paying more for it. How long do you think the German people are going to put up with that? Give them a really good cold winter next year, and I dare say it's not going to be much longer than that winter. And I'm already hearing from friends in the Bundestag that uh, 60 percent or so of the German people in polls are showing that they're not too comfortable with what's going on in Ukraine. And it's not necessarily because of Putin. It's because they don't see any end to it. And they see us fighting it, as I said, to the last dead Ukrainian and themselves too, drug in with us. So changing those politicians when they do is probably going to bring in, bring in a crop of new politicians who are going to fulfill Powell's prediction in 1988-89 um, that, you know, we're going to bust the transatlantic link and NATO is going to collapse and we're going to have a problem, a real problem. And how do you see, do you see any minuscule chance that NATO can save the situation for Ukraine? I do not. I do not. Unless NATO were to enter the war, full force, completely enter the war, com and with the nuclear weapons in the background, um, and they'll always be in the background. I remember John F. Kennedy saying, you never, never, never want to mess around in a conventional war with powers that have nuclear weapons. He was right. He was absolutely right. The temptation there is too strong, just too strong. If two of them have nuclear weapons, and in this case, it would be more than one in NATO, but it would certainly be Washington and Russia, then you're really in danger because then you've got the, the and, and my daughter said the other day, Dad, the U.S. will never lose. And I said, what do you mean by that? She said, because if we are losing, we'll use nuclear weapons. 
She's right. Go back and look at Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Who, who was the first to use nuclear weapons in the world against human beings? Um, I, I have no doubt that we would if we thought we were losing um, against China, for example, or against the coalition of China and Russia together. We would probably use nuclear weapons. That's a sad thing to say. It's a sad commentary on the Congress and the White House, but I fear that is what would happen. We would be the first to use nuclear weapons in duress, if you will. Um, that's not a good place to put us. That's not a good place to go. And that's frightening to me that we're playing around with this as if it's, uh, you know, as if it's winnable, as if victory is something we should be putting out there. Now, I do understand Joe Biden is caught right now. Um, Biden is smarter than this. I, I watched him uh, through Powell's eyes ex exclusively for about four years when he was chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and then when he was the ranking member. And Powell would call him all the time and not talk to Dick Luger, the Republican, or any others because Biden knew the issues. That's what Powell would say to me. Joe knows the issues. So I know he's smarter than this, but he's now he's got himself in a trick bag. He's running for president again. If he shows any ankle on Ukraine between now and the elections, the American people are so into this war, it's falling off a bit now, but still 60, 70% of them are still into this war big time. He'll lose. He knows that. So he can't start negotiations. He should, but he can't politically, domestically, politically, he would be ruined probably. And he's not willing to take that chance. Now, as we get closer to the elections and polls begin to show more weariness with this war, more fatigue with it, maybe that'll change his mind and he'll take a chance on it. But right now, domestic politics in America, which is the most formidable aspect of national security decision-making in Washington, is keeping him from doing it. Do you think that, as, as you mentioned, threat of a nuclear war is so big for us right now? And how, why, why the Biden administration is so willing to continue this war? It's all about the elections? That's part of it now. It, it, it wasn't part of it in the beginning, which is why I was pushing so hard. Diplomacy now, diplomacy now, diplomacy now. Because I knew it'd get caught up in the run for the 2024 presidency. And now it is. Now you can't show any ankle at all until the American people get tired of it. And then maybe you can show some ankle and you can go to diplomacy. Question then is where will we be? I suspect we're going to be with Ukraine begging because it's going to have no ports. It's going to have no commerce. It's going to have probably another 100,000 less men and women. Um, and it's going to be a tragic situation. That, too, puts some other people you know, in for a penny, in for a pound whether it's Berlin, Paris, London, or whatever, when you start losing so badly and you clearly can't do anything about it unless you're willing to escalate and escalate majorly, that's a real danger to escalate. And that, that worries me too, not just the nuclear part of it, but the conventional part of it too. Because that's the way you walk down this very dangerous road of getting the nuclear weapons. You begin to provide F-16s, you begin to fly the airplanes yourself, you begin to come uh, into the war more forcefully in terms of the alliance. No troops on the ground yet, but that's ultimately going to happen, too, if you go down this route. And then you're in a world war. I mean, let's face it, you are. China then has to make some decisions. Do we sit out and watch these people kill each other, maybe with nuclear weapons? Or do we join one side or the other and help bring a decisive and quick end to it? Um, and I'll give you three guesses, and the first two don't count about whose side they'll probably jump in on. You know, if you remember when this war started, in mainstream media, they were all talking about Putin. This is Putin's war. He wants to conquer Europe. And during this war, we learned that Putin is one of the mildest politicians. <laughs> Anybody comes after him is going to be more aggressive. Yes. How did you find that? I think that's true. Uh, you know, it, it was hogwash that Putin threatened the rest of Europe. We, we played that up. London played that up big time because we thought that would solidify NATO. Well, it did momentarily. 
But as I said earlier, it's going to fracture NATO ultimately when some people wake up, particularly when the electorates of these countries wake up. Sweden, Norway, Finland, France, Germany, ultimately, and even England. When their electorates wake up to just how stupid this is, how insane it is, and how dangerous it is, God knows when that'll be, but I suspect it's not outside the next 12 to 18 months. Um, then the whole dynamic is going to change. Then the president's going to have to go out, you know, like the French premier who said, I'm going to the window. And his assistant said, what are you going to the window for? And he said, I'm going to see the people out there in the square. What are you going to do that for? I want to see which way they're going so I can follow them. <laughs> That's what we're going to have. We're going to have a bunch of leaders who are going to say, oh, my God, the people are headed in a different direction. It's going to be that way in Germany. It's going to be that way in Norway and in Finland and in Sweden and in all the new countries, with the possible exception of Poland, who is an unknown in this whole thing, but the stomping ground of empires for about 500 years. And to bring Poland into NATO was insanity. To bring Poland into NATO and say, you have Article 5. Our nuclear umbrella is now over you the battleground of empires for half a millennium. That was insane. When, when we think about Finland, this, this is, Finland is, is the country that survived the Cold War without any How problem. Stupid. How stupid to abandon neutrality. <laughs> Why? Nobody knows what, what's happening in their mind. You know, they have, they have a two-tier system now. Um, I was just briefing on it recently. Um, they have conscripts, and conscripts can't go abroad. They have professionals, volunteers, like we do. They can go abroad. So the Finn, the, the structure, the people in the government recognize this rather sophisticated uh, division in, in their military forces. Why don't they recognize it in a wider venue? I mean, they've been there in that neutral position for how many years? And they've survived, and it's prospered, and they've done well. Um, I, it's just insanity. It's insanity. I, I attribute it to the influence of Washington, and I know that we've been working on them for over 20 years. We've been hammering away and hammering away and trying to get the politicians that we want in the capitals, including – as I said, in Brussels, in NATO. I remember when this war started, one of the main reasons, nobody would thought that Ukraine going to defeat Russia, but they were thinking in Washington, in my opinion, that they're going to trap Russia in Ukraine. They're going to weaken Russia. But it seems to me that a Russian army that was a peacetime army has transformed to a wartime one. How, how, how did you see this transformation? Did you see this transformation like me or, or you, you see something else? I'm not sure because, and I hesitate to make a statement on it because I haven't been on the ground and I haven't actually been there long enough to observe what's happening on the ground. But from what I'm seeing and what I'm reading and what I'm hearing about from Russian friends, from friends in Ukraine, from friends in France and, and elsewhere, um, is that the Russian army went through sort of a, I can't believe this happened to us, period. Um, and the revamping that they did, and uh, I'm told a pretty much a, a wholesale cleaning of house in terms of the intermediate level leaders and such. Most, most people don't understand the Russian army has no non-commissioned officers. In most Western armies, NCOs, non-commissioned officers, are the backbone of the military. They provide the battlefield leadership. The officers are there to use their NCOs to affect the general strategy, the general operational uh, campaign plan or whatever. But the NCOs are key. We have always criticized the Russians. Indeed, Powell in 1992, when he talked to the former Warsaw Pact leaders in Vienna, I think it was, no, it was Warsaw. Um, he told them you should, if you're going to professionalize, you should make sure you get an, a non-commissioned officer corps. Well, the Russians didn't follow his advice. So what you saw initially was um, generals on the battlefield actually trying to affect the battle and getting killed. 
Well, they've, they've kind of revamped that a little bit to now where they do have some people in their intermediate ranks who can handle the battlefield, if you will. Um, not as well as, say, we do or the Germans or others who have different composition of their military, but better. And, and so that's helped them. But the main thing the Russians have is what they showed at Stalingrad, what they showed at Kursk. They have numbers, and they have ferocity, and they have resilience, and they have depth. And that depth goes two ways. It's not only geographic depth, it's also industrial base depth. Now, Ukraine has no industrial base, really. If, if you look at what was happening before this all started, 40% of the Russian military's heavy equipment came from Ukraine. <laughs> so they had enormous capacity to generate tanks and artillery pieces and so forth, but most of it was going to the Russian army. I don't know precisely what's happened to that, but I suspect that it's, it's gone the way that most heavy industry like that goes when you're doing what they're doing right now. It winds up being replaced by what you're getting from NATO, what you're getting from other countries, principally from the United States, but other countries too. Um, and so Ukraine's ability to reconstitute its own industrial base has pretty much disappeared. It's counting on our industrial base, Germany's, France's, and such. The Russians have their own, and it just gets stronger every day. And the reporting in the Western media about the state of the Russian economy is a joke. It's an absolute joke. The Russian economy is clicking right along, doing fairly well. And the price of gas is being insured by Mohammed bin Salman. That people don't understand. We are the greatest oil producer in the world. We, America, we are. Latest figures, I wrote them down here somewhere, but latest figures are about 11.9 million barrels per day for us, 10.8 for Russia, 10.7 for Saudi Arabia, I think something. But they forget. doesn't matter. Our oil costs a fortune to bring out of the ground. Saudi oil costs about 3 to $4 to bring out of the ground. Who's going to be able to ramp up production, bring production down the fastest and the most effectively? Saudi Arabia. And so, you know, as long as they're in league with Russia, and they are, Russian oil is going to sell at a price that Putin likes, and it helps the Russian economy. So the sanctions are nonsense. The sanctions have done very little. They've done some negative things. They've actually made Russia's economy stronger in certain points. Um, so we're losing. We're losing. We just want to admit it. And we know that with all these money and weapons that are going to Ukraine. And we, we know the problem of these neo-Nazis in Ukraine. We have a Russian group in Ukraine, a neo-Nazi Russian group. It's, it's run by somebody like Denis Kapostin. He's a far-right Russian that is fighting Putin on the side of Ukrainian. And how how important is because we have to think about ukraine after this war it's not all about it. this war going to end someday but what's going to happen to because this is a zone that's its security is so important for europe and for russia with all this money and corruption and weapons that that we're pouring in this region how do you see how do you see this because we have the experience in iraq when when Obama when Obama left Iraq left all those weapons in the hand of terrorist groups, how, how do you see that? I see it as a mess. I see it as worse than the Balkans. Um, you know, in in London and in Paris, one of the expressions people use on the street is, "Oh, you're so Balkan," and that was that was a derogatory, a complete derogatory. Well, they're going to be saying the same thing about Ukraine. Incidentally. Prior to 2014, 2015, they were saying that to me. They were saying that to me at the State Department when I was working with Yatoshenko, Tymoshenko, Yanukovych, and a number of other Ukrainians who I knew were crooked as hell. They were all crooked. They were all stealing. Um, don't talk about the Nazis. Talk about the average Ukrainian involved in the government. Um, it, was a, it, it was a criminal enterprise in many respects, just as Albania. Oh, also a member of NATO is a criminal enterprise. Montenegro is also a criminal enterprise. Look at the requirements for NATO membership. We lied. We cheated. We stole. We let these countries in 
And they didn't pass any of the requirements for entry into NATO. We did it because we wanted to expand NATO and we wanted Lockheed Martin to be able to sell weapons to more and more countries, more and more people. It had nothing to do with security. It had everything to do with making money. Um, that's a problem now significantly because what you just said is manifested not just in Ukraine, but in other places too. It's in Kosovo, which after all is, you know, Albanian. <laughs> and Putin has just stopped recently his machinations in the northern part of Kosovo because he doesn't have enough troops to go around. Um, that's also a problem from Dushanbe to Azerbaijan. We have a, a problem in there now with the restless people because Russia was sort of keeping a cap on a lot of that. No one's doing that now. That's bothering Beijing significantly because it sees all this happening. Um, it, it, this is going to be turmoil for a long time to come, and Ukraine is not going to settle down for a decade or two. And guess what we all ought to be doing right now? You know in Brazil, you know in spades, we should be all cooperating to meet this threat that's going to kill us all called the climate crisis. And this is not going to help at all. This is not going to help at all. It's not helping now. We're degrading the environment majorly in that part of the world still when we need to be saving it. Pentagon watchdog just reported that last year those weapons some of those weapons that were sent to ukraine were stolen and nobody knows who who stole those weapons who are going to buy those weapons just the day came out a russian a, a african leader said these weapons sent to ukraine are appearing in africa what's the problem for africa well, how this problem went to africa <laughs> well the first thing about africa is it is a disaster and Powell and I and a number of other members of the Joint, Ch Joint Chiefs of Staff talked about this. We would never have allowed, Powell would never have allowed the standing up of Africa Command. Because what we did when we stood up Africa Command was we militarized our policy vis-a-vis -vis Africa. And you're seeing that right now reflected in uh, overthrown governments from one end of the Sahel to the other. This latest one in Niger is the, just the, the culminating one, if you will. Militarizing Africa was the wrong thing to do. And if you want an answer to your question, that comes along with militarization. You get this arms traffic, you get this arms trade. Some of it's, uh, quote, legitimate, unquote, because it's us arming the different leaders. On the other side, it's the Wagner Group. It's Russia arming the other leaders. And in the end, at the end of the day, they do with those arms precisely what they did with the arms we gave them when they professed to be anti-communist, or in the case of the Soviet Union, they professed to be anti-West. They're oppressing their own people. They're conducting coups and so forth. So we've militarized the last place on earth that needed militarizing, and that's Africa. Now, how, what's your estimation on this war? Do you think with the level of casualty and the weapon destructions that is happening in Ukraine. How long Ukrainians can continue this war? They've shown that they have a great deal of resilience and stamina and courage, just genuine courage. Um, and, and when I say that, I, I go back to what I said about the corruption in the government. The young people themselves, the people that are on the battlefield right now, seem to be pretty pretty stalwart, pretty brave. Um, and that's, that's a great reflection on uh, the Ukrainian youth let's say 30 and below. Uh, it's not any reflection on the corruption that was above them. And I, I would almost bet if you went in a foxhole or in the trench with one of them and ask them about their own government, <laughs> they, they probably wouldn't have too many positive things to say about it. Now, they might about Zelensky because he's brought a patina of legitimacy that none of these other leaders had, Russian-sponsored or Western-sponsored. None of the others did. They all were just dripping corruption. Whether, the, whether Moscow put them in or we put them in, they were dripping corruption. Zelensky does not seem to be of that caliber. I don't know him personally, but he doesn't seem to be of that caliber. So they may have some respect for him, but I almost guarantee you they have no respect for most of the rest of the government. But they're fighting. They're fighting for their soil. They're fighting for their home. They're fighting for those things that all of us would fight for at the end of the day. And that's, that, that's, uh, that's admirable, I think. But... I wouldn't, you know, we're cheating them. We're we're just cheating them because they're not going to win. And look at how many people they're losing. I mean, Ukraine has lost 
a significant body of its population, either through refugee status, and many of them won't come back, or through death. And that you don't recover to that. That's the French after World War I. You don't recover from that too soon. And that's going to be a real hole in the heart of Europe. Um, and it's going to be a lot of hatred and a lot of animosity in the heart of Europe, too. Uh, you even have Russians now, Russian-speaking Ukrainians from Odessa to the eastern border of Ukraine who don't like Russia anymore because of what Putin has done. So you've created all this hatred and passionate dislike for everybody by doing this. Uh, it's going to take a long time for that to resolve, to, to reduce itself and to be dealable with, manageable. As you mentioned, climate change is one of the important issues that we are dealing with right now. But with the U.S. security strategy, if you if you one of the main issues in this in this strategy is this division between democracies and autocracies. When you put you put this line between democracies and autocracies, how can you deal with China, Russia? You cannot label countries like this so simply so. So it, it, it doesn't make sense to put to labeling these countries as autocracies. If you put this label on them, how can you negotiate with them? How, how can you make it negotiations, peace talks? How, how do you see this? Good point. You know, the tornado coming down the road or the hurricane coming down the road or the heat or whatever aspect of the climate crisis you wish to talk about has no respect for your type of government. It is going to wipe you out regardless of who you are. Um, and so this moment of, you know, I, I talk about it this way with my students and increasingly with American audiences. We need comedy, cooperation, and collaboration. That's what we need. We need comedy to bring some kind of harmony to what we're doing. We need cooperation because you can't do it alone. You simply cannot beat the climate crisis alone. And you need cooperation because that's what's going to get it. That's what's going to do it, whether whether it's China, Washington, the northern tier, if you will, helping the southern cone, helping the global south, whatever. It's all going to have to be done together or reasonably together or it won't work. It's, it's that simple. So I don't care if you're a Fosseus or a Democrat or whatever, if we've got to pitch in together and save the planet or not save the planet. Planet doesn't give a hang. Planet will go on for another 4 billion years, strike the sun, burn out. That's what they all tell me, the, the people who know about these things. Um, it won't care. We'll be gone. Just like the dinosaurs, we'll be gone. We are the first generation in 5,000 years, arguably in the history of hominids on this planet. We are the first generation to be aware that we're destroying ourselves, have the technology and capability to do something about it. The question is, do we have the wisdom to execute it? And right now, the answer to that question seems to be a resounding no. And the other thing that we see in this war in Ukraine, and also this foreign policy of Biden administration, if you, if you, 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 you probably know that Tony Blinken went to China to negotiate with them. And when he came back, Biden just called Xi as a dictator. You know, just to see, if if you imagine Putin or Xi sitting in their com countries and seeing these mixed messages coming from the Biden administration, how 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 they would react to these to these comments by them? Well, it's certainly not a way to build comedy, cooperation, and collaboration. <laughs> no way. I have no respect for Blinken. No respect at all. He's not a diplomat. He's an arm of the empire. So is Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor. The only positive about Tony Blinken is he's not Victoria Newland. <laughs> if she gets made secretary of state, I'm moving. <laughs> the, the group is there. They're still there. They were all around me in 2002 and three and four, the neoconservatives. They're there. They are people who want to hoist the rest of the world on their spearhead and take charge of everything in the name of democracy, freedom, liberty, and so forth, which they know absolutely nothing about. They're Fosseus themselves. 
the sad reality about Ukraine is that if Biden administration was willing to negotiate with Putin, even in March 2022, after going inside Ukraine, if they're willing to negotiate, Ukraine still had those eastern parts, Donbass, everything, and nobody was getting killed. We know how many people got killed in this war so far. It's something like 350,000 soldiers, Ukrainian soldiers, something like 40,000, 50,000 Russian soldiers. Nobody knows the, the, the correct number of, of these casualties. But with, with just this administration could have solved all the problems just by negotiating with Putin. Well, diplomacy is almost always the right answer. Um, there's no question about that. I mean, you look at any conflict since World War II, and you can find yourself a diplomatic avenue that would have prevented the majority of the killing. You can find your, you know, look at Iraq in 2003. There were enough signs, and I fault myself for this, for not seeing some of the signs. There were enough signs that you could have put Hans Blick and the, Blick, Hans Blick and the, the, uh, weapons inspectors back into Iraq, you could have gotten about 99% certainty as to whether or not there were any WMD in Iraq. And then you could have dealt with the other issues, which people were saying were adamant. Uh, you know, the biggest issue of all was Israel. There's no question in my mind now. The biggest issue of all was Israel and the security of Israel and cheap oil for Israel. There's a book coming out in about a month that's going to talk about this in, in in detail, if it gets through the CIA DOD uh, review process without being massively redacted. Um, cheap oil was one of the major motivations for the Iraq war, cheap oil for Israel. Child Netanyahu made the Israeli economy so strong that he could continue to get elected again and again and again because people didn't want to throw out the man who'd brought them Wow, look at the money we're making now. Do you know more billionaires per capita live in Israel than the United States? <laughs> that wasn't true 20 years ago. <laughs> so if you had used diplomacy then, if you'd used diplomacy, we recognized the Taliban as the official legitimate government of Afghanistan in 2000. We had an opportunity to get bin Laden out of Afghanistan diplomatically if we'd worked at it day and night and taken Mullah Omar aside and some of his counselors and, you know, presented to them the, the choices they had instead of pontificating from the White House and saying, this wasn't a terrorist attack, this was an act of war. Go back and look at President Bush's press conference. At that moment, he negated all diplomatic opportunities because he declared the war instrument was what he was going to respond with, and he did so. And he didn't leave after he'd used that. Or arguably, you could say, okay, you bash the Taliban, you bash al-Qaeda, now leave. And tell them, the government, you'll come back and do it again if they sponsor terrorism again. Now, that would have been a medium-range solution. But diplomacy could have handled that one. Diplomacy could handle most of the conflicts in the world if people were serious about it. But they're not. They're not because they make too damn much money off these wars. And that money goes back into the political coffers. It goes back into the oligarchs' coffers in Moscow. And, you know, you have endless war because it makes money for a very small percentage of people in the world. Go back and look at 1937, 1938, 1939, when DuPont was selling things to Hitler, when Ford Motor Company was selling things to Hitler and continued to sell things to him throughout the war years. And you understand the guys who win from war are those people who are up there on the top raking in the money. In your opinion, what is the possibility for having a new Ukraine in Asia, in Taiwan? Uh, too strong, too possible, too uh, too much our fault in many respects because we have taken our policy of strategic ambiguity, which worked for years and years, 
and turned it uh, into strategic clarity. That is to say, we will defend you, Taiwan. And that's a red line for Xi Jinping. The fact that he hasn't acted on it, except uh, in terms of uh, uh, flurries of military action around Taipei, which has probably given them some <laughs> some deep concern, but he hasn't acted on it in, in terms of severing the relationship and using military force to reestablish Taiwan as a part of China is, is just a, an indication that he's smarter than we are. China does not want a war with Taiwan. They do not want to use military force against Taiwan. The economic relationship is robust, strong, and productive for both sides, particularly Fujian province in China and uh, the whole of Taiwan. Um, why disturb that? It will automatically probably turn out that within a generation, they'll be so close, as Mao said, like lips and teeth, they'll be so close that they will be, for all practical purposes, economic and financial, unified. <laughs> Whether or not they call them a, a province of China or not probably won't matter that much to Taipei as long as it's peaceful. So why not just let that play out? Let that play out. Don't be pontificating about how you're going to defend Taiwan. Well, Biden has kind of stopped doing that now, and that's a positive development. Um, I haven't heard him use some of the more forceful language he was using, the bombast he was using, in some time. So that I hope that's going to persist. But it's a dangerous situation, too. And that one, too, would go nuclear because we're going to lose. There's no way we are going to mount a conventional military operation against China and win. No way. Heavy attrition to their Navy and their Air Force. We can't even gauge their Army because there's no way we're going to invade China. Our Army's so small, it would get lost in three minutes. So what's going to happen? We're going to use nuclear weapons. That's, I think, a sine qua non of any scenario you might develop with regard to Taiwan. And that doesn't need to happen. That does not need to happen. Considering what's happening inside Taiwan, do you see any group, any like these neo-Nazis in Ukraine, that is willing to go along with the Washington's agenda in Taiwan? Well, there are, there are people, I found out in 2001 and 2002 with Chen Shui, Chen Shui Bian, when he was really poking a finger in Beijing's eyes by threatening to have a referendum to declare officially Taiwan independence. Um, that was a red line with Beijing. And we, we at state literally had to send someone to Taipei almost every week to disabuse Chen Shui Bian of his desires because Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense, and the Vice President, Dick Cheney, were inciting him to do that because they wanted a new Cold War and they saw China as the most prospective agent in that war. Um, we managed to succeed there because most Americans don't know this. George W. Bush, the president of the United States, was on Colin Powell's side because he understood the importance of China to the American economy at that time. And so he was on Powell's side. He finally rebuked Chen Shui Bian publicly and told him to shut up. Um, and that sort of that sort of put him back in his box. But yeah, there are some people in Taiwan who would like to stir it up. Just to wrap up this session, I want my last question goes to Donald Trump and RFK Jr., these two candidates. Both of them are against this war in Ukraine. How do you see first, let's talk about Trump. How do you see his chances in Republican Party? Is he going to be able to make it into the nomination process? As it appears right now, yes. And that gives you some idea of the sad state of my political party, the Republican Party. It's a disaster. That no one has the courage, nor the skill, politically or otherwise, to wrest it back from him and to bring some sanity back to it is a real indictment of the Republican Party and its leadership. Um, I don't think he's going to wind up in the White House. Um, Biden would really have to be either dying, <laughs> which, which could happen. Uh, that's what you get when you get an 80-year-old president. 
um, or some political blow hit him in, from the economy or from Ukraine or wherever that was just devastating and was unforeseen for him to be vulnerable, in my view, because I think 60 percent of Americans are, are, you know, will hold their nose, if nothing else, and vote for Joe Biden. They will not vote for Donald Trump. Now, these polls they're showing are just the way the American media keeps everything going, you know. Uh, it's atrocious. Our media is so corrupt today that they they are warmongers. They are reporters of uh, of false facts that they they go along with the what what makes their headlines sell papers or whatever. They're in such incredible competition with the internet and other sources of news now. My young people don't read newspapers anymore. The people I teach do not read newspapers anymore or magazines. And that's the future. You know, so they don't, they, they'll do anything to sell their papers, to get the online version or the paper version. They'll do anything. And, and so the media is out. You, you can't get anything from our media anymore. That's anything but hype. So where do the American people get their information now? That That's key. Putin figured that out. Xi figured that out. He's giving them information. Xi and Putin both are giving them information through social networks. Um, we studied that in 2019 and 2020, and I was stunned when I saw what Google showed us. Yeah, Google. <laughs> what Alphabet, what Steve Schmidt and others in the leadership. Um, when we saw what Putin had done, for example, with regard to the uh, vote in, in the U.K. for the EU membership or not, um, Putin influenced that vote probably as much as one to one and a half percent. Go back and look at the vote. <laughs> that was enough to influence the vote. So you've got that now, too. You've got others understanding how important this social media is and infiltrating it and influencing voters, especially young voters. Um, it's, it's a dangerous world, in other words, uh, and it's it's not necessarily any more dangerous for autocratic states than it is for democracies, but democracies are not dealing with their weakness, weaknesses very well. And how about RFK Jr.? Do you see any chance of him getting the nomination or even being accepted in the Demo Democratic Party? To the latter, I would say no, knowing the leadership of the Democratic Party, particularly the Democratic Committee. Um, and RFK, probably were he to get on every ballot and were he to run, he would probably do Biden some damage. Would that be enough damage to bring him down to where the Electoral College and other things that are unique to our system would put Trump back in the White House? Well, my question then is, and I remember what Justice Scalia on the Supreme Court, for whom I had no love for sure, but he made one comment, I think it was him that made the comment, that was very illustrative. He said the Constitution is not a pact for suicide. Well, these people who say there's nothing in the Constitution about a man running from prison or being president for prison or the Secret Service being in his prison cell to protect him, they're nuts. They're absolutely nuts in my view. There's no way that if he is indicted and convicted of any of the charges against him right now, that he should be allowed to run for president of the United States. Hey, let's have a constitutional amendment if we need to. But it's it's just poppycock that we, you know, Al Capone could run for president of the United States. That's crazy, in my view. That's not democracy. That's idiocy. Because it, if Biden gets elected, Again, we don't. I don't know if we're going to be able to end this war in Ukraine because it seems to me that we I know think it's this. The first thing he'll do, the very first thing he'll do diplomatically, is go for whatever is necessary to get a diplomatic solution to this conflict, because then the pressure will be off. The pressure will be off him unless he goes nuts, and I'm not discounting that entirely. Biden had these these tendencies to grab a hold of an issue and pursue it until it almost sunk him. I mean, in the Senate, you could do that, and you could resurrect yourself and revive. President, you can't do that. 